with for the previous month's minutes. Thank you, Thomas. I'll second. <laughs> You'll second. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? All right, we're, we're good. Okay, moving right along then. Uh, public vote to be heard. Do we have any public vote to be heard? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Then if that's the case, then let's get, for, uh, let's get into it. The new business, Recreational Programming Products. So we're going to jump in, everybody, with Sarah Taylor, our Hi, Sarah. Aquatic, <laughs> area, aquatic Area Supervisor. And she's going to go through some things we've got going on. Right. Let's make sure we're sharing. Yes. Oh, he was there on the bottom. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's great. I can see it. Let's go. Oh, All right. You guys ready? Yes. So thank you guys for having me here. My name is Sarah Taylor. I'm the Recreation Area Supervisor for Aquatics and Ice. And Ben called about a week and a half ago and said, will you do a really short presentation for Prad? Keep it as short as possible. So I'm going to try to keep it short, but there's a lot of fun and exciting things going on in Aquatics and Ice. And so here we go. So this is our team getting ready for summer a couple of seasons ago. Um, and so here you go, summer pool memories are brought to you by, this is the full-time aquatic team that we have for aquatics and ice. Up here, you've got Heather Gaines, she's our swim lesson specialist, and Emily Shep, our aquatic facility lead. Mm -hmm. We had an aquatic, um, a swim instructor staff training this past October for Halloween, everybody got dressed up, and of course they brought their mermaid tails. Um, we have Cam James down here, she's another aquatic facility lead. Dalton, Casey, Molly, Jorgensen, Izzy Nevis are our recreation program coordinators. Um, Izzy just joined the team the, the end of April, and she has been hitting the ground running and absorbing as much information as we keep throwing at her, and she's already doing phenomenal. Um, we have Nick Kukaro. He's our pool technician. We're thankful this is his second summer. We don't have to go through all the first again like we did last summer. Uh, Philip Henry. He's our recreation maintenance supervisor. You've got myself, and then that's my son, Matt, who you'll see throughout. We like to swim a lot. And then we also have Joanna McClure. She is our office assistant. So this is the full-time team behind all the hard work. To get started, some of the things we've been working on this past April and May is getting Sunset Pool and the outdoor pools ready. Nick did a great job of doing a time lapse, a couple of videos of filling up Sunset. And this was Sunset, um, Sunset Pool at the end of last week. Oh, that's super exciting. Well, it is for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of the things that we've done at Sunset last fall, we refinished our slides. You can see the difference. And this is not Photoshopped. <laughs> that is how faded and on the inside of the slides, they were starting to get big chips. Um, so that was a big project we were able to take care of last fall to get us prepared for this year. Um, that's just a picture of our domestic, um, of our water mixer for the domestic hot water tanks. We'll be getting another tank in. That was a project that was recently finished. This past April, we retiled the hot tub at the Longmont Recreation Center, and this is a picture after it's done. Um, a big project we've been working on is Kanamoto Activity Pool. We lost some water last year, and we started investigating it, and this year we were able to get some great leak detectors out, and we were able to identify the leak. We dug up the concrete, found the cracked pipe, fixed it, air pressured. Ugh, it didn't hold the air. Brought the leak detector back out. He found another cracked pipe. We were able to dig it, expose it, and cap it off for the season. So we are now set to fill by the end of this week. So we will have Kanamoto on track for opening May 31st. And then our other pool, Roosevelt Activity Pool, we're going to start filling that one next week. It will be ready to open by June 4th. The other fun thing that we do, besides building the facilities and getting them ready, is, is we've got a ton of programming going on. Uh, we are, this summer, we're expanding our swim lessons offering. We're going to be offering them at Centennial Pool Saturday afternoons and Sunday afternoons. We've never done Saturday mornings and Saturday afternoons for swim lessons. We're trying to see what fits our community. 
something pretty neat uh, because we were awarded funds for the 200 free swim lessons, we were able to fill almost all, a majority of our swim lessons at Centennial for that Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon with um, our free swimmers. And that free swim lesson program was geared for youth um, three to 10 who have never had experience and that are scared of water. So really entry level swimmers that have never had an opportunity to participate. Um, with that, that expands Centennial Pools hours, that Saturday afternoon time slot and the Sunday afternoon time slot. We're also going to do swim lessons at Kanemoto Activity Pool. We haven't done it before. And we programmed them to be for parents and tots early Friday mornings before we open. Kanemoto is nice and warm, about 89 degrees, 86, 89 on oh, this really cool space. But we love that pool. Uh, something different, private swim lessons. We changed the format for the summer and now we're going to have it where people can register in advance for private swim lessons. We've got a program just like we do our group swim lessons, trying to make the process more efficient and easier for our patrons and our swim instructors. Uh, water safety instructor class, that is the American Cross class that we run to train our swim lesson instructors to teach American Red Cross classes. We're super excited. We just found out last week. American Red Cross has lowered the age requirement from 16 to 15. That means we can get even more youth um, certified to teach water safety instructor classes. We've got a class planned at the end of May. We already have 12. We're hoping to bump it up to 16, which would be our max with two people. If I'm talking too fast, you can tell me to slow You're doing down. Great. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> like I said, Benson, you're short. <laughs> um, long walk swim instructor class, that's our in house swim instructor class. This is Heather. She's our swim lesson specialist, and there's Matt. You're going to see Matt everywhere, and I'll have to point him out to you, uh, my son. And um, she recently got done teaching in our in-house long run swim instructor class last two weeks of April. We gained about seven new swim instructors from that class. Lifeguard classes, um, we've got a huge one end of our Memorial Weekend, trying to get 20 kids in that one, and we just wrapped one up two weeks ago, two weekends ago. Lifeguard instructor class, this is something we haven't been able to offer since pre-COVID. This class trains people to teach lifeguard classes. We're excited about this because it opens up the opportunity to other front range aquatic professionals to come to us, pay us around $450 for this Red Cross certification. Um, this will also help us with our pool managers because we will be enrolling our pool managers in our in-house class to up their level of safety and their certifications as well. Uh, babysitting classes, we have those over at Sunset Pool in the summer, about every other Friday. Always super popular, care swim teams, we'll keep those going on at Centennial Pool and Sunset Pool. Middle school nights this year, instead of doing two, we're going to do five. We're going to, I know, <laughs> it's kind of, it's big news. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big deal because we can get anywhere from 100 to like 350 middle schoolers from all the schools, from everywhere at Sunset Pool. That's the one event where we take out all the lane lines and the kids go crazy. We staff it with a ton of people and we get as many adults there as possible, but we have a great time. Open water swims at Union Reservoir, ongoing. We're keeping those capped at 50 people. We realize that our course can't handle more than 50. And it gets a little interesting the week before one of the big triathlons at Boulder Reservoir or Union, because everybody wants to come to our reservoir to practice. Activity pool after hour rentals. We haven't done those since pre-COVID, so we're bringing those back this year, as well as keeping Roosevelt Activity Pool open seven days a week instead of just five. So we're super excited for all the things that we're offering this summer. Oh, and then the other fun part is that we will, in June, we start planning for the fall, and for our team, that means planning for the ice pavilion and our ice programs. Is it okay that I moved you down here? Yeah. Okay. Other fun things that we do to get ready, recruitment, interviews, and hiring. We need us to my son. And then this is Lauren. That is our recreation athletic supervisor's daughter. So mm -hmm. we're, always, we're always training, recruiting. Uh, these are just our interviews by the numbers from the summertime. And this is our April and May numbers. Over 180 hours of, or in, or not even hours, that's actually wrong. I should have just said interviews. Some of these interviews can take 15 minutes. Some of them can take an hour, depending on the level of certification and the level that they're looking for. A pool manager interview, 
that's a big deal. They're in charge of a lot of safety at all of our facilities, so we want to make sure we're hiring the right people. That interview is going to be at least an hour, um, and then we throw in some safety skills for them to demonstrate to us on the spot. Um, so there's our interviews, a little sample of that. Trainings and orientations that we've had just in A. Now that's correct with the hours. In aquatics, we love trainings. That's what we do. I feel like that's what we're doing the majority of the time, and that's kind of how we spend our May and our summer. We're always training our staff. Um, and with our team, it's not just lifeguards, it's not just pool managers, it's swim instructors, our front desk, our concessionaires. Uh, we have a huge team. With our staff, we want to make sure that they're up to date on all their skills. We want to make sure that our college kids who have left us for nine months remember how to do all their skills. So we make them run through their trainings again. Um, and then with our, say for example, our pool managers with their 35 hours, they have to learn the ins and the outs of all five of our facilities a lot of the times. And it's a lot. And then when you throw in all of the computer aspects, so when you go to an activity pool, the way that we have those set up, you have your lead lifeguards rotating between taking the money, working at the front desk, and then lifeguarding and taking turns. So in addition to knowing all their safety skills, they also know how to have to do our recreation um, registration system. Union Swim Beach. With Union Swim Beach, our new exciting project this year are our two brand new um, safety sheds. The, this, these are going to be used for storing our aquatic um, rescue equipment. We have enormous rescue boards, about 10 feet, that our staff will get on and paddle out or hang out at the end of the beach to be able to provide another additional surveillance lifeguard station. Um, we keep our kayaks in here. These were used from the 2023 one-time funds. We were able to purchase those. They're almost done. We still need to build a porch and a, an awning for it because we want to have an exterior safe, uh, first aid station for patrons to come to and have a better spot for our down lifeguards to rest and be available if anybody needs them. So there's our union. And then we also do ice at all times. Um, this is our new view Zamboni. We are super excited about our maintenance supervisor, Phil. He actually flew up to Minneapolis back in April to inspect it with one of the fleet technicians to make sure we were getting a good used new view Zamboni. Um, this was the video he sent me. I'm like, Whoa, look at that Zamboni. You know, what do you, what do you say? <laughs> um, so that Zamboni passed inspection. They did make a couple of repairs before they sent it to us, and it arrived in our hands, and there's Nick, our pool and ice technician, at the end of April. Um, in addition to ice, other big things that we're doing, we are, the new chiller is happening this year. We started the designing and the processing with training our company that has committed to making that new chiller for us, and our goal is to have that in place ready to rock for the 2024-2025 season. Um, so that's another fun thing that's happening, getting a brand new chiller. We also invested in additional glycol ice mats to expand, expand, expand our rink, and so now our rink will actually be a little bit bigger next year as well. So we're, we're excited about having, we're gonna have a really fun season of ice next year. Future, other thing, in far, far future ideas. So we are looking at an, ex an extended shutdown in 2025 for the Long Run Recreation Center Leisure Pool. This leisure pool play feature, it's done. <laughs> it is time. This thing's been here, what, almost, what, 15, 20 years? 20, It feels like 15, 20 years, if that says anything. Uh, we're looking to replace this item with something that has a lot more of a fun factor and more opportunities for children and to, of different ages to do things at the recreation center. Um, this is not going to be the final drawing, don't, don't get too attached, um, but this is really close to what we want to do. We want more slides, we want more fun, we want to make sure have like a more isolated splash zone because not everybody wants to be splashed, um, but we still want to make sure that we're balancing the fun factor with the pool space so we still have open space for people to recreate and to be able to run our swim lesson program. So that's the 
far, far future. We're kind of excited for the August shutdown this year to get out there with the designer and really lay out like a nice blueprint to make sure that we can see what our foot, our footprint would be on the pool. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the fun with our upcoming future projects 2025. And then there's my son enjoying all of our pools last <laughs> summer. Let's see, the Kanemoto, Kanemoto, and Roosevelt. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's very good. Well, thank you. Uh, yes. uh, can you just, I'm sorry, can you just put Sam Absolutely. so we can see if he has any questions too? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. And then, uh, Paige, did you have something you wanted to start with? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's super cool. exciting. It's really great to see all of this. I mean, and bringing the schools back online, like so many of them, extending the hours. Um, that's really great to see. And also, um, I'm a big proponent for the hockey and the ice program, so I'm really glad to see the improvements that are being made there that I was just talking about it. I think that will really expand. And I'd love to follow up with you just about some programming yes. questions and conversations. We don't have to get into it today, but if, you're, if you don't mind, I'd love to June is our time. June is when we kind of create the plan for the fall. Yeah, so I'll get in touch, but thank that you. That sounds so, great. Sounds really great. <laughs> I wish you also had a brand new pool to be thinking about, but. <laughs> you know, we are we are happy with taking care of what we've got, and it's really exciting to think about how do we rebrand the recreation center and really kind of re-energize that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're great. Uh, Sam, did you have anything? Do you want to take questions? No, excellent. Excellent update. I really appreciate it. No bigger questions. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thomas, anyway? No, yeah. <laughs> I have to agree. Yeah. Oh, goodness, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And the, no, that was that's, that's going to do. So I think there's no other comments or questions on that on that topic. Excited to get my Yeah. A lot of a lot of exciting stuff for this year too. We we are so excited, and that's why I was happy to be able to kind of showcase, give you a picture of the full time team. Mm -hmm. Everybody's working so hard, and I've got such a passionate crew. And, I was happy that they all, they, they deal with all my crazy ed techs, and I'm like, I need pictures, I need selfies for this presentation, and I'm so proud of them for doing cool selfies. <laughs> and the, the Zamboni, hopefully, yeah. Well, and the chiller was a big problem oh, last year. Oh my god, it was like, so what? hard. The so I'm really I'm glad all. to see that's happening. We awesome. all are. <laughs> we are ready. Yeah, yeah. now that's really great. Okay, well, I will close that one. Yes, Zoom is still open. And then, are you guys next? We're going to turn it over. Yeah, we're going to move into the Discuss Evaluating the City's Green Space System. And then, let me get you. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. Let's get it set up here. Share While they're screen. doing that, I'll just give a quick little connection for this piece. Talking on the work in this is one of the things that, again, as we're looking at our parks and um, green spaces and how it ties into um, council's desire to engage our communities more and try to make sure we're having easy access to all of our green spaces for all of our um, communities. So I think this is a great, great piece, but it's also going to be a piece that is, if you look at this, you'll see some natural connections where I think in June or July, um, Taylor's will be coming to about the work we're doing um, with Thorne Institute and Kids in Nature program. And this is going to be some of the information that helps feed into that, and there's great overlaps with this program, too. So. You're good? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Sarah, you can get going if you need to. Sarah, you're supposed to. Oh, what did I leave? Oh, sorry. Oh, I will. <laughs> so I do know how to I was going to say, well, it's sharing. Is, can Sam see it? Sam, Is can you see it? Uh, I see teams with green space system. Okay, um, and that's that's how you know you're sharing. There you go. Is it better now? Yes, I see it now. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for asking. <laughs> and thank you for uh, letting us share an update on this uh, effort. As David mentioned, uh, we are starting to analyze and evaluate the uh, green space system that we have in the city. Um, so it's kind of a progress update rather than a finished product. So feel free to share opinions and thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, there is a need, as we see it currently, uh, all the council, council priorities um, for the 2023 are somehow affected by the work that we're doing in our department, as you know. And then um, I will not get into it much more because you are more aware of all the ways that um, the department is helping to push those priorities forward. It's the same for the guiding principles uh, for Envision Longman. All of those principles, um, in one way or another, are rooted in the work that is done within the department with green space. And um, additionally, there is active growth that Longmont is experiencing. You're all aware, um, better than I am, uh, that uh, Longmont is expected to add 24,000 new residents by 2035, which is approximately <coughs> a quarter of current population. Um, so it's quite a bit of quite a bit more people, and um, it's growing at an average um, of 7.6 percent. No, sorry, it's not an average. It's from 2010 to 2020. The population increased by 7.6%, which is a lot higher than national average. And another need is um, gauging the state of the system prior to the formal update of the master plan uh, for the parks, recreation, and trails. Uh, the master plan has been completed in 2014. Um, so before we are able to get to this master planning, I guess it's a good time to take a closer look at what we have done, what we have accomplished. Uh, for the purpose of this effort, we are defining green space as any area predominantly covered with vegetation, such as trees, shrubs, grass, and flowers. These spaces include community areas like parks um, and um, other places that are free from buildings and hardscape. And uh, those places allow people to connect with nature amidst the city life. Uh, so what would be the components of this evaluation? First, we need to take a look at the existing conditions and see what are current resources and gaps, and then um, this could help us set priorities for the future. And some of the start that we've uh, begun on uh, was looking at the service area or park access areas. Uh, you could see two different areas highlighted here. <clears throat> the line shows uh, the radius, which is a uh, half a mile radius from the edge of the park. And then the shaded area, blue area, shows you 10 minute walk, uh, which sometimes is coincidental, like in this case right here, but most often it stops short. So what it means is that either the path to travel along a sidewalk is longer, you know, it's a wavy path rather than a straight line. Or perhaps, in a lot of cases, the sidewalks are completely missing. Um, and in some of those areas, they're missing for a reason because there is no de development there, no residential infrastructure. In other cases, there could be improvements. Um, trust for the public land is uh, who came up with this metric, the 10 minute walk, and they have um, started this initiative in 2016, 10 minute walk community. 
And a lot of communities, um, actually over 300 communities countrywide, have gotten on board with this initiative and uh, mayors have assigned the goal to the jurisdiction to become tenant or community because very few are already tenant or communities. Uh, but what has been discovered in the process of this analysis and establishment of this initiative was um, that often communities of color and communities of low income are disproportionately disserviced by parks. Um, the park area might be smaller in those communities and then the level of service is also of a lesser quality. Um, so it is a, a national, national statistic, and I guess what we're looking at here right now is trying to see what our existing system shows us with data. And uh, on this map, you can see uh, three parks that are somewhat in progress, uh, that are new. Um, some are more in progress than others, uh, but you could see how um, the orange outline, and orange shaded uh, area, helps to add to the service area of existing parks. And then an additional um, layer to consider here is uh, all the properties that the city owns. Um, you could see there are quite a wide variety of the properties that the city has ownership over. So some of them would be relevant to what we're talking about, like the golf course or nature area. But others, um, like public safety owned properties, might not be very relevant to open space. But still, it, if it's city owned, it's worth considering. But what's good to know is where those areas that are owned by the city overlap with the gaps in the service. So where we could find opportunity in expanding service potentially uh, along the city property, because that's the easiest way to expand, of course. And then, as I've mentioned, uh, it is often typical countrywide um, that the service area gaps uh, coincided with the uh, communities in need. And um, this analysis here overlaps um, the neighborhood vulnerability with the gaps and the access to the parks. And uh, I guess going a little more deeper into the vulnerability mapping, this was done by the neighborhoods department in the city uh, for the uh, climate, um, for the extreme heat study that they've done. And they overlapped uh, population in poverty, population without college degree, household income, population using SNAPs, outdoor workers, to come up with those colors. So like when you combine all those metrics, you get this cumulative um, neighborhood vulnerability. And if you go back, you could see that this gap in the middle, kind of in the historic center of the city, overlaps also with the high vulnerability area. Um, this um, is a map uh, to kind of think about park safety and how we could increase that. Um, the gradients here are showing areas with high and low uh, vandalism in the parks. And this data is generated uh, through work orders. And then the white dots are where uh, cameras have been installed in the parks. Mm -hmm. And there's actually newer data that shows the decrease in vandalism, but I don't have it yet in mapped here. Mm -hmm. Based on where the cameras are. And then another um, set of facts or data points is demographics. And I have pulled just a few different metrics. Uh, I guess the power of demographics to me is 
comparative rather than abstract. We're talking about just one entity. Um, and um, I grabbed the city of Longmont overall in comparison with the population uh, that is one and a half miles around Kensington Park. Uh, Kensington Park is uh, on our CIP requests for next year. Um, so that was my choice, but it could be any part mm -hmm. pretty much, I guess. You know, we could look at differences or like comparing two different parks could be also a way to go. So I'm going to maybe move around this section a little bit. Maybe here would be a good place to um, So I'm just going to let you take a look rather than reading all the statistics, maybe highlighting a few. But um, you could see that the area around uh, Kensington is mostly residential. Not much employment going on, but unemployment is something that this area struggles with in comparison with the overall situation with Longmont. Mm. You would see drastic change in the median household income and other similar statistics. And then this is a um, population at risk profile. Uh, you could see, I guess it's hard to compare the quantity versus quantity over, overall in the city versus quantity in a small area. But you know we know that there are 15 households without vehicles, um, which bring back, I guess, the need for those sidewalks and connectivity to the parks um, rather than just the radius of service. Some other statistics, uh, you could see Spanish population that doesn't speak English. I'm not sure how to, well, I might have been the wrong choice. <laughs> Um, and then I guess how we could use this information, this data, to think about the future of the park system and the city overall. Uh, this uh, yellow and red map is uh, from the city of, from Envision Longmont uh, document. It shows areas of change versus areas of stability. Areas of change are red and areas of stability are yellow. I guess the quickest description of areas of stability would be established residential neighborhoods because those don't change, don't seem to change as often as um, industrial and commercial corridors, as the red kind of in general relates to. Um, so, what is interesting and exciting about this is where we have a car and cap, uh, there is also an area of change. So, we know that there will be something going on with uh, changing this area. More, moreover, this is um, in our zoning highlighted as a future mixed use um, corridor. And this could be used as an opportunity not to only fill in the gap for the parks, but also to help shape this development, maybe to help uh, with the increased um, density and other aspects of this development to make it more livable, but also functioning better with the parks in mind. And then another aspect of um, how parks, I guess it's similar uh, vein of thought, but parks could help uh, catalyze development. So in areas where parks have been established, um, in lots of them, uh, often, private investment follows. And um, there have been multiple studies, but one of those uh, shows an approximate amount of investment from seven to $20 uh, compared to $1 of public investment, uh, which is very significant. So uh, we know that the development world knows the value of the parkland. And um, potentially, this could help us uh, shape better environment for the during the active growth period. There are uh, lots of uh, impacts, specifically economic impacts, uh, financial performance impacts, 
that part development uh, has um, integrated within itself. Uh, healthcare savings, tourism, increased tax revenues, uh, decreased stormwater treatment costs. Um, we know that here, specifically with the resilience and rain, uh, that this is a big concern. Uh, business and talent attraction, also a very um, big factor for the city. Uh, community capacity is, I guess, community resilience, another way to think about it. Um, but access to open spaces and nature increases the ability of community to bounce back after negative, negative environmental or otherwise uh, factors. And then property value increases, and then there are jobs associated with building parks. So looking at this data and thinking ahead, we could start making more informed decisions about what do we want to do next, uh, how do we want to grow, and thinking about policies and target areas that could help us get there. And I would like to get your feedback on community engagement specifically. You are part of the community, and um, it would be great if this effort was coordinated locally with people that live here, rather than just um, you know analytical exercise that's done inside. Uh, so if you have any suggestions, these are some ideas that we were brainstorming for kind of engagement inside of Longmont, but then what are some areas in the broader community that you could advise to engage with? And any other advice on community engagement? Like what out of this you would think would be best to share or, you know, any thoughts of this kind would be appreciated. And then I guess I, I want to also share a quote with you um, that resonates with me, uh, that everybody needs beauty as well as bread and places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. And um, on this note, this is over for my presentation, but I hope you guys could share some thoughts. Great, thank you. Uh, any comments, questions to start off with? I have a bunch, but... Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, then let's start with you, Paige. Here you go. Yeah, so thank you. It's really exciting that you're doing this. And I just want to make clear, so are you still in the process of gathering yes. data? Yes. And then you're going to put that together for some kind of community engagement? Well, I'm hoping just like with this meeting here, that community engagement could help inform the process, not only share information with community. That's my goal. Okay. But and are you yeah. looking at both, so both parks and greenways? Like the whole open space system? That's the goal. Okay. I think one thing is, as we started this, and there was a point where the master plans were needed to be updated. We had project manager, remember Steve and Kathy brought this, it was time to do this. Um, Harold and Joni and Dale Radnick were saying, why are we engaging in updating a master plan when we really don't know what we've already accomplished and there's probably stuff out there to do still. So this, I think, was a, a good look at what we've been doing, how that really aligned with the master plans that we have and are we achieving those goals. So not only is it, here's the things we've done, but have those things help achieve those goals. I think this is where in this time, period of getting ready for a master plan. I think it's going to give us some good ideas as we move forward for that next master plan phase that we can move into that with some good data. And do you, so does the master plan, I mean, have you done that kind of side by side? Like, here's what the master plan says and here's what we've actually accomplished. Because yeah, I mean, that, I didn't yes. see that, but I think that would yeah. be super helpful. And then I mean, just for sharing with people, it's like, well, here's, if you really want to say, here's what we've accomplished and here's, Kind of what's left and then um it would like if you i don't know if you're looking at that 10 minute walk as a potential goal for a long run. i mean i think that would be great i mean i we i work with tpl a lot i don't know if you guys 
you have contacts right. with them, I'm sure, but. Um, if you wanted be great, to yeah. be more in touch with them, I'd be happy to connect you with Trust for Public Land locally. Um, to, but I think that it would be, I know that they also look at it, it's not just like, are you 10 minutes from any park, but like the quality. quality. Yes. Yeah, like to, is there a sort of equitable access to parks of similar quality and then kind of connecting those, you mentioned the urban tree canopy. But like, can people get to the park? You know, it, is it is there like a shaded walk? Is there like, you know, just thinking about those connections too, like between parks. So like the quality of how you know, the quality of the park, the quality of how you get there right. too. Because yeah. some, like some really sidewalks are sidewalks, are sidewalks across <laughs> the at grade crossings right. that have you know poor visibility. So those are all things that are important. And I do think that one of the things is we did talk about including the open space in this. Um, in that mass plan update, that is one thing we talk about is parks, open space, and the trails and recreation. So there is a bigger holistic right. look at this whole piece because again, that open space piece in and around the city adds value. It may not be the same sort of park-like experience, experience, but it's a different experience. Yeah. Exactly. As you're moving through a space on a greenway through an open space, it's a different experience in, in urban areas. So I think these are all those pieces as again, we get ready for those bigger master plans that I, I think Harold for sure is someone that really wants to see data driven decisions and this is kind of giving us an opportunity to collect some data a lot of times we get to the point where we ask the question they're asked the question um what data do you have and it's like well we should have been asking this question 20 years ago mm -hmm. um so i think we're finally getting a little bit of a head start before we get to that point yeah. so you definitely would want then i would think i mean i would love to see you guys like go out to different parks and nature areas and be able to engage with you know, maybe you could go on Saturdays, or, you know, I don't know if that's even possible, but be able to ask people, like, a certain set of questions about what they want and what their experiences are. This is where I think, again, how we put these pieces together, because there's a lot there, yeah. and this is where I think it really gives us, again, to hear from you, Paige, and this group helps a lot, too, because this one thing with the Thorn and the Kids and Nature Peace, unfortunately, that's a year of engagement, and how do you really engage? Because you go to park, and the demographic is the group that always use it. You're not getting people who don't use it. And you don't know why they're using it. So part of that is really trying to figure out how we engage the people that maybe aren't there that could be there. So that's another piece. And then Tatiana has another piece that she's been working with the city of Denver to look at better ways that we can see who is living around our parks, who's coming to the parks, who's not coming to the parks, right. and seeing where we have those gaps as well. No, I think it's great. I think it's great. Is that great? Yeah, I had another question about the heat map side of things. Sorry. Yeah. Um, when we were looking at that section up in the uh, north center section, there was a big red square that said that it was just essentially like a big no. Like when I'm looking at that as a member, like trying to make sure that I'm thinking about the public, like that's a, that's a, an area there that draws a lot of attention even though i don't think it's is it something that can is fixable like that's it's just houses there right and that's why you can't do that if we keep going back a little bit further um yeah that one um yes. yeah uh maybe a little bit it further goes back it kind of goes within the bubbles too like yeah i think that was it like that hole there in between all of our radiuses, yes. is that something that is a developable, fixable thing, or is it? Right? Well, and I guess it depends how you look at it. There are lots of layers to it. Right, yeah. I, I think it's an area that I think Tatiana brought up the fact that there's future development in that. That's one of the areas that really is up. It, it has low income trailer parks housing. It has it does have some of the, the lower um, income portions of our city. So I, I think it's an area that really, just like you did, it's like, why, why have we yeah. got to this spot and what can we do? And maybe it looks different. Maybe it's working with developers. Maybe it's grants. Maybe it's just like you say, increasing those trails to get people to those surrounding parts. But um, I think in 10 or 15 years, that looks the same. We've done a really disservice yeah. to our community. So I, I think highlighting it and recognizing it is the first place we can start. And I think that's what's really been beneficial with this project. What, what streets is that on? Seventeenth, yeah. North of the cemetery. Yeah, yeah, and then south of Seventeenth. Yes, 
west of me. There is some open land up there. We've had people approach the city. The church. Yeah, there's yeah, churches up there. there. There actually be a couple quarry area from there. Yeah. But again, I think the problem is a lot of those developers want to sell it at the price of development. It's hard to buy a park at development Unless prices. you know what you're paying for exactly right. why, yeah. it depends kind of how you look at it. I was just going to say, I would love to have this, I mean, sooner than later, be connected with the conversation the city's having about affordable housing and even about infill and density development because I feel like right now we're hearing a lot about density, but we're not hearing a lot about sort of quality of life or living in that they density. They all hear from me all the time. So well, I think, I think they, they need to hear more because, yeah. you know, just <laughs> living in you know, dense housing without like thoughtful access to green space associated with that is not good quality of life. You're just shutting people into, you know, I under, I, I'm all for like the benefits of density, but it only works if you're also balancing it with keeping spaces open. So, so I don't know. I mean, let me know, let us know like how we could inform that conversation as part of this because I guess. we're going to run out of opportunities right. to yes. yeah. provide this if we keep the just like, now, right. yeah. 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 I, I really appreciate it. that's one of the things I think that anytime we talk about this this piece it really is that I, my piece is that every time we build affordable housing they don't have a backyard they don't have that our parks become their backyards becomes their green space so it's really important every time we talk about building increased density to think about how we're tying that to some sort of green some space of which I think is great. Yeah. 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 I have to say, Jeff, do you have questions? I know you, you asked questions of me, I'm like, I don't know if I answer all these, Jeff. So. You mentioned the golf courses, which is a whole different topic. I, I agree that they are green spaces. I think we have to be cautious about not it's encouraging... Not the park, though. What? It's not the park, though. It's not the... No, you can't. Open. You can't encourage people to go there during yes. golf. I mean, if if people get people use the golf courses a lot prior to the first tee time and after the last tee time, and, and, Is that I, and I think that's yeah. I I think I believe okay. so. But we can't have people walking their dogs while people like me are hitting golf balls. <laughs> <laughs> You left, right? What? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. I am not a good golfer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of what I was saying about like you might be next to an area that's like a small, sort of actually a drainage area or, right. you know, like something that's green, but it's not an accessible quality, either nature experience or play park experience. So, do you, do you think school facility, you know, parks, again, after school hours, should be included? Well, they're not included in this. So I guess what's included right now is just parks that are open, you know, mm -hmm. classical mm -hmm. parks. I have a comment on that, Jeff. I, I would say yes, except in my experience, the school district is quite opposed to public use of their facilities after hours. Yeah. From a liability perspective, which I personally disagree with, I would love to work with them on, but they have a very strict policy of actually blocking and closing playgrounds and green spaces wherever possible, at least where I live. So I don't think we should consider them unless they change that policy. I don't have a park in my area, so we're, uh, we use the school district property. And I think, again, I'm going back to your piece of acting now is probably one of the most important things. For me, again, I think. Having this information, I think, helps conversations with the school district. I mean, these are the kids that, you know, are in their schools and stuff, and what can we do together to help? If we, if we can't fix it as just a city with a park there, what else can we do collaboratively? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess in that same area, you mentioned, I think, uh, that uh, there is a church that has a lot of land, and that right now kind of acts like green space. They have community gardens, they have some shade uh, but can we consider this a service area as a public park i'm not sure you know what i mean but maybe there could be another layer of analysis that's considering all other spaces that act like at least green space maybe not the park but still help mitigate a lot of the effects of the urban living right but you 
would want to just just think about that equitable access again. It is it's like if the only place someone has access to is not really a public park, right. then yeah. it's not secure access. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I mean, this is great. I mean, I'd love to hear more as you guys are thinking about how you want to share this. And is so you're connecting this with the phone. Project. Have you talked to Taylor much about that? Yeah, we've been talking with Taylor, um, and hopefully, Thor could benefit from some of this, while this could also benefit from their on the ground um, engagement. Uh, they are right now putting together a survey, a list of questions, um, and I'm trying to help them having um, a mapping aspect for this so that. Yeah. Their survey answers at once get on the map um, for different abilities to sort and filter to understand the data better. Right. We'll see how it works out, but we are, yes, in conversations with that. Yeah, and again, I, I know they're all busy with their family stuff the evening too, but it would be nice if when the dealers here maybe if you wouldn't mind coming back and being able to talk about how these are overlapping. And again, I think. Mm -hmm. The questions you have from tonight, I think, will be very relevant as Taylor's talking as well. So, when are you aiming for? I feel like I keep asking this. The to re start redoing the master plan, and like when is the time to sort of be bringing up these conversations to the city council? You know, about we, we've not put it in the twenty-five budget. I think this is probably be helping form. So maybe in the twenty-six, it might be a good time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, Harold. Harold really wants. Some of the things that were identified in the, in the Park Rec and Trail Master Plan to be completed before we start identifying other things. Okay. Right. And it'll be helpful to go into the Master Plan redo, like having, knowing a little bit about right. what the council's vision is, and that vision would ideally be informed by. Yeah. And I think we're know, doing, <laughs> it is a little bit, you know, we, we don't have full access, but I think as, as Tatiana started off the presentation, we're going right back to those council work plans and saying, how does this work tie into that? So as we're making these presentations that um, even though I have them sitting here with us, and we do have a great council member that I think does a good job of staying engaged, um, but we can really try this right back to the work plans that we're trying to, to do. A little bit of managing up on that. But yeah. Hey, remember, if you want to do this, this is a great way to do it. Yeah. And, and the project manager, the priority is A5. And if we updated the master plan, it would distract from that. We can't have that. Well, that's fine. But yeah. like, build the strongest case so that when you do the master plan, yeah. you have clear direction. Like, yeah. the master plan should prioritize these things. Yes. Thank you. Did you have something you want to No, that's all right. Yeah, it got, it got answered well. <laughs> As we can. You can't continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think if you if you have this, could you share it with me? Because I will I like will you share the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Sam, any comments, questions from your perspective? Any feedback on the community engagement piece? Do you have know an ask? Uh, no, no major questions. Uh, really good presentation. I always, I'm a sucker for a lot of maps. So I yeah, that. yeah. Um, I was just, I, I was looking for um, like a population based map like this, which would show a population that's not serviced by this. I saw a few comparisons of social vulnerability and those different indices that were here, which are great. But I think in Longmont, there are a lot of areas like in the western part of the city boundary where it's not actually populated, so they look like they're gaps, but they're not really populated gaps. The actual impact is lower. So I think I'm not like this with a <coughs> population. So you could see some yeah. of it, yeah, that's in progress, but you could see some of it, um, some of the outlying areas that don't have much population. This is uh, gray on this map, for instance. It's areas where population is less than 25 I residents. See. But it's very hard to Okay, that helps. Residents. No, but, that helps. Uh, I'm hoping to do a more focused, I guess, population rather than just part of this. 
Thank you. Some of the ones that don't have color on them, are they, uh, they they're, like they might have blue or whatever because they have the population, but they don't have the vulnerability rating. We just haven't studied that yet. Gray? No, I mean like, like Willow Farm Park and well, you know, like all these, like what, like, like I can't see the vulnerability. There's a bunch of maps. It's, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the one. You could see it here better because it has less information. Okay. So it, 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 it just low vulnerability. Because like I, I'm like looking at this area and it's like, I, yeah, it's interesting because I, I know it's really high vulnerability in some of those areas. I mean, like, you know, we've got like a bunch of trailer parks in those areas and low income housing in some of those areas and and, and like by, I like by Kanemoto and Quail and all that stuff. So that was just interested. It was like, yeah. The blue that you saw, the outline was a one half mile radius from the edge of the park, and the shading was a 10 minute walk. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry. And then just talking, this came, this information came from our neighborhood yes. team. Yes, our neighborhood yeah. team, the, like, how the Wayne's work group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they overlap to get this vulnerability, they overlap several other ratings. Mm -hmm. And I guess in this yeah. one, population without a college degree, that area does show up as kind of. Deepish red, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of population poverty, it's not as red as some of the other areas, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. not yellow either. So I guess when you overlap all those, yeah, ones together, that's good. and outdoor that's workers good. and SNAP are pretty bright. So yeah, interesting. Thank you for sharing. Really interesting data. Yeah. Awesome. Always fun to look at the data like this. Yeah. Data's cool. She knows how to work her way through GIS pretty well. So <laughs> yeah. it's impressive. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. All right, so I think we'll move on from this topic and get a general college of questions. Great. Uh, yes, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so okay, moving on, we're going to move on to the combined discussion. We're going to talk about the org retreats and also the planning for the fee for a field trip. So, uh, wanted to quickly touch on the first on the on the board retreat. So, we had the poll that went out two months ago yep. now, yeah, uh, to, to see availability. Uh, unfortunately, with that poll, uh, the only date that could have maybe worked was June 8th, yeah. but now we have David who can't make it and also two board members who can't make it, right? Yeah. So it just doesn't really make sense that to, to have hardly, you know, skeleton crew. And so I, I think that what that means is we might want to explore a weekday instead of a weekend unfortunately, and to make it work. Um, so I'm to start with that, just that, uh, you know, update. The other thing I want to talk about is in, it's also in the packet on uh, page seven, which is the the retreat topics themselves. Let me take a look at that real quick here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well. Great. Uh, looking at each of the topics, and this is I want to open this up for discussion as well uh, from the group. From what I can, from what I'm seeing is the most highly rated topic for the board retreat is the field trip site visit in general because that that is everyone has either a one or two so for myself uh, uh, as highlighted. so this makes me think of okay well if everyone really just wants the field trip in the first place then are we maybe we should just reverse order of operations and do the field trip first but of course on on a weekday but I want to just pause there and open up for discussion. And also, I know Dave wants to say something. Nope. wants to say something. So, okay. there's a field trip. There's an yeah. open space. And there's also an open space, space on yes okay. on the fourteenth. On the fourteenth. Yes. One one of the things uh, I think it was David and Sam and Nick and I talked about was with the field trip, with with all the work that's being done on the the new parks. It might be good to actually take you out there and. And have you firsthand see what's going on at those okay. locations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's separate from the one on the fourteenth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
So I know I threw a couple of ideas at, at the group just now on, you know, unfortunately, Q&A didn't work out. Um, you know, should we press forward with a board review on a different topic? Are we comfortable with just consolidating it down to, um, you know, a field trip like that? What are the thoughts in the group? I like that idea. I mean, I was one of the people that liked it. But yeah. I like the, like, talking and learning in the field, you know, yeah. in sort of real time. I think that's always helpful. Uh, just wanted to ask Aaron, Sam, any comments from yourselves? Are you okay with your thoughts? I'm confused, so okay. I'm like just you know okay, still being confused. confused. Um, I'm like so that we're saying that there is a field trip on the 14th, uh, but it's not for, it's not specific to us. It's not our no. Oh, it's the one that it's went out for space. like everybody yeah. in yes. the whole world. It really, yeah, it really is an open space tour. Um, Susie Hidalgo Baring is the one that asked for an updated council. We wanted to time that with a field trip. We had done that last year, and that was really more tied around some of the oil and gas work because that's so tied into the open space. We're going to talk about it, but people really enjoy getting out and seeing the open space property. So, this really is um, trying to tie in our field trip with the council presentation we're asked to do by Susie. And so, the, the other side of that is June 8th was the date that had. The four of the six board members that could attend, and we questioned whether it made sense to do that with just uh, excuse me four of the six of, of you. And and the thing that we discussed is would it be better if we didn't try to take one of your Saturdays? Would it work better if we took a day during the week? And maybe it would take two different nights where we would have a topic one night. And another topic the other night. So before I vote on topics, I would just be I I don't want to vote on a topic. If you already I'm voted not, on topics. No, so. but if we were because you got we were kind of gonna re-vote on topics, it sounded like I would just want to know when it was, because if I'm not gonna be there, then I should not vote. Does that make sense? And I think we're talking about rather than having like an indoor Board kind of retreat. Yeah. yeah. Just doing the field trip. That's what I mean. Is I shouldn't probably vote on whether you even do that if it's on the date that I can't go, because that wouldn't that would be silly. That we haven't. Yeah, let's talk about a date before you say you can't be there. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, I just looking at my summer schedule, and you're saying right. weekday evenings on there, right? Many of them until right. July. Well, and it, it yeah. doesn't have to be right now. It could be. August, if you want that as, as well. Right. That, that's up to. Uh, didn't we? When, didn't we used we do to do it in the August. one we did, though, that was. It was in the evening, right? Like yeah. we met at like four right. or yeah. something, and then we. Yes. What was yeah. on a Monday? Well, those would be just too hot, I think. Yeah. That's another factor, yeah. Right. <laughs> what? When we did the last one? Yeah, we started at five from here and then tried to have everybody back by eight o'clock, I think it was. It was a couple years ago. Yeah. 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 I mean, could we start like a little earlier? And do it on Monday. Depends on everybody. I mean, for staff, that isn't a problem. That's whether everybody can get off of work and get here in time. I can't plan ahead, like a ways. Right. <laughs> so, I'll just say for me, for me, a weeknight easier than the weekends. Uh, in the yeah. All right. That's good to know. Okay. So do we want to try to pick a night, or do you want us to do another survey? Next question that I was going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, please. Yeah, no, sure. no, you're right. Let's do another survey and extend it out. Another survey. And this would be for a field trip site visit, not a board retreat, indoor board retreat, and it would be a weeknight. You could start your survey after the week of the July. That would help me. And start later on. Yeah. Yes, she into July. July works better for you as well. Yeah, yeah I, work, I just work so much this okay. summer, but that's okay. Yeah, it, July's better than June because I work almost okay. every day in June. Mm -hmm. so, and there will be more to see in July. Construction homes, too. Right now, it's just a bunch of dirt moving. <laughs> so it's you not like all that exciting. I don't know. I like dirt. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. There will still so be dirt. Tomorrow. We can do sorrel, stay on course. So we'll send out another survey with it starting 
mid to late July into August. But do we want to pick a certain, I mean, do Mondays generally work? Well, I mean, you know how we got everywhere to go that last time, time before last, is we put it on a parks meeting night. Right. 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 I, I think we're trying to do both, okay. not not to lose time. Right. Okay. But, no, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just threw that out, not that that. No, no, I, I, I yeah, there, there's logic to it, for sure. Um, yeah, so you're going to send out a survey? Yeah. yeah. We're going to focus on a field-based review. Yeah. yeah. A field-based review, yeah. And I would say, so just to go, to go with that, I was just going to say, I think since you will have staff there, if there's, if you go, if you all want to send in certain questions or topics you'd like to talk about, you have staff kind of prepared if it's one of the sites we're going to or you want to hear more about it, if it's the funding for how we do our parks. Um, I would say that we all fit into one one of your rec bands last time, didn't we? Yeah. I think we can either talk on there or when we get out, we can have that conversation on site. But I, I think there's a great opportunity to say to do the on site piece and um, we just give staff a little bit of heads up. We try to prepare certain topics if you really want to hear about something. Okay, right. great. Cool. Something we, we don't need to um, do anything now, we're just going to do the survey. Yeah. Thank you for your patience and working through this so we can all. We all want, want this, I, I know, we love to happen, but um, being aligned is always tricky, but we're getting there. Okay, um, so if that's the case, then we have covered the board retreat uh, and the field trip discussion, so then we are on to discussing items from the packet updates. I have a question from last month's, the minutes from last month's meeting. Okay, okay. we did approve those, but yeah, you can yeah, no, it's, okay. not, yeah. it's not an edit. I think it's, <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> we got a packet a update. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so you had, it sounds like you talked about, or Danielle talked about potential um, open space purchase priorities, and mm -hmm. one was a state land board parcel near Button Rock. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could just tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so it's an in holding up there that we have been paying a recreational lease on, mm -hmm. and the state land board, in their contract with us on that recreational lease, does not allow for public recreation on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it basically allows us to have the property keep from others from getting that lease. So it's basically a piece of we've been leasing, allows us to keep, you know, other activities from happening there, but it really does not give us the freedom to use it the way we would like to. The state land board has been trying to divest to some of those properties over the years. They also have pretty um, inflated idea of what those properties are worth. Um, but they have a lot of leverage too, because they can easily say, if, if you don't, we could offer it to this person and they could put, we could give them access to that property too. So they're not always the easiest to work with, um, but it's one that... Have you talked with them? Lately, directly, I don't think so. Person? Um, Danielle has not given me an update on that, so I don't know. Do you know about that one, or do you have a contact? No, part of why I'm asking is because um, the Nature Conservancy is working with the state land board um, in a totally different geography, but we're working with them to try to find um, ways to purchase high conservation value oh. lands out yep. of the state trust land so that they get the money they need for their exactly. mission and actually so say that we can protect lands that have conservation value so i was just interested in learning more about that to see if there was any connection so we have a couple of options so i think having danielle maybe reach out to you to see yeah. if we do that'd be great um right now with our open space funds we are stretched um, with the things we're doing the some of our greenway acquisitions and stuff that have turned out to be more Extensively a plan and some of the other options we have. So, if we leverage dollars, it'd be great. It also is really at the Button Rock watershed, which really has, we should be able to do some water resources dollars up in that area too. So, we're trying to figure that out. And just to go back, that again, if ever doesn't know, the state land board, those dollars are really for the schools. Yeah. So, again, when they're saying that they want top dollar and might kind of push back on that, it really is, for, I mean, at one point, they would have generated their money from mining or for timber or sheep grazing. That's just not as what it used to be. So they are really are trying to get dollars for the schools. So it's a it's a worthy cause too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would. I'd love to talk to Jane about That'd be a great. bit more. Thank you. 
I had a question about, you know, I could, there was a, a discussion of a event at Union Reservoir with Senator Bennett. Um, can we talk a bit more about that or hear more about what that was? I, I would have liked to know what was happening if you guys knew, but I think there's some kind of potential for some significant funding for the Water Conservancy District. So I don't have a whole lot. Um, I, I just know that I got called in kind of the last minute because of our senior ranger over there making um, the area accessible to the senator. Um, there really are some, like you say, funding opportunities for large water projects in Colorado. St. Brain, this is where again, maybe if someone could come and talk to this group. St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy District um, is a group in the area that really helps us and local agricultural producers manage the water, help shift water around in ways and make it um, more valuable during irrigation time for the farming community, more valuable for the, the downriver communities that need water for their for their domestic portfolios, ways that they can hold water and then manage it to make the river whole in those off seasons. It's a pretty complicated system. So St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy really this was, was really driving that. Um, the city has been on that board for a long time. Ken Houston from the Water Group is on that. Danielle is now on that in place of Dan Wolfert, who was on it. So we do have a pretty good seat at the table for that group. I don't have a good idea what really happened to that because we really just want to make our so it's available. They told us he wanted a boat ride out in the reservoir. What weather didn't really turn out that well, so we didn't do that. So I'm not sure all what was talked about, but I need to have Chelsea, who was there, or I have Danielle maybe bring some minutes from. And, and I don't think there was much notice either. No, there wasn't. It was a story about it somewhere. But. Yeah, I got I got a call and say, can you make sure that you have people out there so people are out there on their days off? That was good. Well, yeah, I, I would love to hear from the, the district about it. seems like a chance to do some real good work at Union. I think people have a lot of interest in that and short term plans. So there's a chance to combine forces. That seems really good. And I, let me just tell you. This as well, I think that would be a great opportunity. The thing with some of these boards, because they do represent private water share interests, sometimes we wear different hats and those sort of things. So Danielle's on St. Green Lupton Water Conservancy District. I'm on the union um, board as well as a couple others with the city. So it may be a good point probably we'll want to come talk to this group about some of the opportunities that are coming out. And it's always hard because, I mean, when they're in the planning stage, you know, what's going to happen. It can really cause people to kind of move in one direction and those dollars can fall apart. But we may not have the support we need. But um, I think that that visit probably was um, foreshadowing of potential opportunities. I think they got some IRA money. They might have. Can I ask another question? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, okay, thanks, sorry, it's hard to interrupt. Yeah. I have a question, there's two there's two parcels in the border of Longmont that the county's acquiring as open space. One down by Lincoln's Gulch, that's the former farmland, I think, just oh. north of the Greenway there. Boulder County, Sky Pilot Park. Of, yeah, and then one north of um, the Colorado Reservoir on Dune Highway, kind of west of town. Are you guys engaged at all with the county's plans for those properties? So the Sky Pilot Farm, which is over by Airport Road, I think they are trying to utilize that as part of their new farmers program. There's a lot of people in the community that like to get into local food production, needing a place to do that. I'm not sure of all the details, but um, I do know they did talk to us about that when they did that one. The one up by McCall, I'm not sure about where is that one at, because this it's at six six nine six nine New Highway. It's like a hundred acres, just a big piece of land. It's a nice property. Okay. I should know if they to talk to you guys at all, but it's, it's not important. Just interested if you have the background. No, it's just I think that all ties in because if you remember this this group supported us when we purchased that last lot around the call. So now the city has all that area. Um, the county has Toti Branch, which is a beautiful hay producing field up in that area. So I think it just kind of ties in some of those other pieces. That, you know, create greater connectivity up along that 66 corridor. So, and I think that area falls into that historic viewshed area as well, too. Paige? So, I noticed that it says on May 28th there's an open space presentation for council. 
yep. open space for past, present, and future. Yep, so that was Danielle had given that presentation to this group about the open space program, and that was again when Susie asked for a presentation, that's what she's going to be giving one similar to that. She's kind of run by our leadership to see what they want to do. So we'll be giving it at that point, and that's what we're kind of then trying to use that as a springboard to get people interested in the, in the two of them. And will you talk about any of the work that Tatiana's doing? That was probably not in that for Danielle, but it is great. I and mean, it might be worth yes. mentioning. Yep. Just to tee up. Any other items? All right. Uh, okay. Then moving on, then we'll look at items from staff. Yeah, I have I have one. We need we need two volunteers to help with interviews. We have, of course, the one vacancy. Mm -hmm. uh, six people have applied and uh, need help doing interviews that would need to be done by June fifth. Happy to help. Okay. Seven up. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Right, we'll get with you to get those scheduled. Sounds good. Great. That's it for me. Oh, awesome. Six, 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 huh? Yeah. Six, 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 six. And they would, but they wouldn't start till when? I think uh, in July. July. Yeah. They would start in July. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're off cycle because right. of the vacancy. Right. Okay. And so we would only bring on one to yeah. fill that vacancy, and then it would be okay. And then we'd do it again in the. Uh, no, late fall. Okay. No, I do not have anything. Thank you. I can give updates on parks if you guys want. Sure. Let yeah. me do what we can. I'm going to send a presentation to her, even though she's gone to Sarah's. Thank Probably the best. Let's see if that works. It's kind of weird using word that one. <laughs> Looking for messages. You told me not to read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I mean to use. How did you do that? I went into the Zoom. dots, the downfall, and then opened from the desktop. You could probably, with this one, you could probably go through the other way. Do you know how to put the Word document to open on the desktop app? Mm -hmm. So if you go, sorry, no, go to the Zoom. You taught me that trick. So. Uh -huh. I, I open it and then share your screen. I put your share screen and then pick it. Is that it? Sam, and then I'll go to presentation. All right. Okay. This is harder than what I had to, to share. Um, <laughs> can you just do slideshow? Yes. There we go. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good, then. Okay. Okay. Well, I just wanted to show <laughs> this Zoom, but I hate Teams. It's, so ugly. it's hard to use Teams. I have to use Teams. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, I just wanted to get an update. So you know, we'll go on a tour, but this is what um, Clover Meadows currently, um, they've started pouring some concrete. Um, they've done a lot of their underground utility work. Um, they've had a few weather days just due to water and muddy conditions, but the further they get, the more they can do whenever there's still those rain. Mm -hmm. um, so that one's still on track. We have Dry Creek Community Park. Um, so also, there's a little bit further behind in Clover, it's Tatiana's project. Um, so they're starting to move along with Burke and starting to put in the system that's going to end up being the weather turf. Um, so this one is a big project of not, not many parts like the other parts, just a very large effort. Um, let's see. So Fox Meadows, um, so we have an appropriation um, it needs to occur, um, according to our finance team, that'll be the end of May. Um, and that's right on target with when our GMP needs to be established. Um, and so we still anticipate a June construction start date. 
That's Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gross maximum price. So that we, we already have the contract with the contractor, but it establishes what that contract price will be. Right. Thompson Park Renewal is currently out to bid. Um, the bids will come in on the 23rd. We anticipate, anticipate making an award um, by May 30th with construction starting in June. The areas of the park that will be under construction, for the most part, are shown in those dash lines. There will be other work, but those are the big pieces. I'm a little curious about this, because I always thought Thompson Park was pretty awesome how it was. Mm -hmm. So, what's going on? Yeah, like I keep hearing this, but I don't really know the deeds about what's going on. Like, what, what are we changing? Yeah, so new playground in the same location, a little bit different footprint, just to make it more fun, more amenities for the kids, okay. more play elements. Um, we're going to rework some of the sidewalks that are leading from the the sidewalk that goes around the perimeter of the park to the playground and to the restroom building, okay. making this a little bit more organic in nature. Um, people love those routes already, so I just didn't want to be able to walk them. Yeah, so yeah. smart. I like that. Like social trails. Exactly. Always just follow the social trail. And new shelters. Those shelters out there are really aged. So just something that's more probably standard and more maintainable now. Yeah. Um, and then restroom will stay the way it is, just with an upgraded interior to be ADA compliant and um, gender neutral. Then there will be some irrigation um, you know, improvements as well and whatnot. But those are the big pieces. Yeah. And I think one of the pieces, again, when you talk about upgrading playgrounds and stuff, some of this is really a fun factor. And again, Tatiana's, some of the work he's doing with Denver is showing that when you build a new fun, Place ago, people will make a that that sort of that walking distance changes because people will kind of abandon the local park to go to the newer, funner places. What it kind of sounds like. Um, the other piece was really the main. This is the big one, Denver. Yes. We might look like yeah, it. we might be the same oh, numbers, but, but, but um, yeah. the other piece is really trying. Yeah. 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 Or you like it better? I mean, yeah, we still. I mean, we. You know, Parks because of that. Yeah. But the maintenance piece, a lot of our stuff when we get you have a playground or shelter, you can't go to parts anymore. There's a certain point okay. where you just cannot continue to ban either. Because I like those shelters a right. lot. That's I kind of like them better than the newer shelters. Yeah. They have a better, they just look more woodsy and right. older for that older neighborhood, which I like. You yeah, know, it's like old. Yes. Yeah, they're authentically old and it makes you feel like you're going <laughs> in a different time and you can picture that your grandma was here, yeah. maybe, you know, or whatever. Right. But I get it if they're not. Maintainable, that's a thing. I mean, I also like, you know, thatch roofs, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Gallo, so that's along the same time frame. We're also waiting for that appropriation, which is also the last week of May. <coughs> so then that will go out to bid the first week of June, pending that appropriation from council. And then parks projects completed uh, Roosevelt Park Rose Garden. Um, it used to look like this around some of those perimeter beds. At the Rose Garden, and so now you can see where they put in the new um, borders. And so I do understand Taylor's team is going to do a volunteer event to, to not plant these. Um, and so this was right after construction, so it's going to look really nice this summer. It's a lot of work. It just kind of can, can cleans things and cleans places up. Mm -hmm. it, it looks really nice. Yeah. Compared to that out there. And this will be a shout out to our partners on it too. Taylor's done a great job with the volunteer group, but she also has been partnering with them. Um, Flower bed, and they have been coming out and then helping as well. And they wear the purple shirts oh, so nice. people can utilize them as questions. Oh, I have this at my house, so they're out there and they can map the stuff. I mean, they work and talk. <laughs> That's great. Do you know if um, she's contacted Tom and Hope? They are, they're back working as well. Okay. They used to be with us, I think. They have a history of working with They are back doing it as well, too. So Kensington's complete. This is, it looks different today because it. It's not construction fencing around it, but um, this is the, the result of the repair. Um, if you wonder why this block is different colored, it was intentional. This building was built so long ago, and the city didn't build it. We're not really sure. It, no. it, we don't have a lot of information on this building. Um, so the architect decided to just not try and match it, but intentionally make the public side different. So. But it's clean on the inside. It's got natural light through both sides. and. Um, that's what you want in the restroom. So oligarchy bridge renewal has been completed. So it used to be this chipped and raised and non ADA compliant bridge with um, an abutment that needed a lot of work below. Um, so worked through with the contractor um, earlier in the year. 
and they repaired the abutment and made repairs to the bridge and the platform. So that was done. And then um, the trail project statuses. So Spring Gulch 2 is still anticipated June of this year. They're working on the underpass at, at train tracks. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, currently, and I think every all the concrete's been poured up into the underpass at this point, and so that's just the last link for that project. Dry Creek Trail Connection, that's going to be going to bid in the 2024 with construction in 25. So that is on track, and it will still connect from behind Sands Club, and then ultimately over through these streets with bike lanes to Sunset. And then we all know about that. <laughs> They have a, oh, and um, they have awarded that, let's see, I'm on the levy project, uh, but they're waiting on some more land deals. I would say, yeah, sure. Steve okay. had updated that. Um, and that's about all I know on that one. For, are you talking about it? By, uh, I just wrong? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, so they were working on, there was a piece, and I don't know what it is exactly, but. So they're not under construction, and they haven't been noticed to award, but they have found a contractor. So that'll then determine the time frame on that slide, and they'll go right dry creek, but we don't still have a time frame on that. And an upcoming um, design for Roosevelt Park renewal. So it's the playground, adult fitness course being installed, design um, end of this year with construction beginning of next year. And then the Garden Acres Bridge pedestrian um, bridge replacement. Not a pedestrian replacement. Um, but this is the existing bridge. Um, we're going to utilize some of those bridges that we have stored um, from past years. And I think that over here, this is also one of Todd Dam's projects. So. And then Dog Park One. Um, there will be some improvements made. We will put the shelter that we've salvaged from the museum, currently storing it. Um, we'll get that moved over here, adding some water to the park and some other improvements to make it a destination. And it's to just it needs some some love, so I think that's all we've got. Great. I like the photos that really helps. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Agreed. The photos are great to see like live action. Um, okay. Uh, no more items from staff. Items from the board. Sam? Definitely. Okay. All right. Uh, well, then we can move to adjournment if there's a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn this meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh. I second it. All right. You have yeah. second. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All those in favor? All right. And uh, we're adjourned. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. So, Sam, whole meeting?